And we're live. Five, four, three, two, one. Committee on Finance, Tuesday the 23rd of March, 2021. Council Member Wyatt. Here. Council Member Bowman. Present. Council Member Rivera. Present. Council Member Wingo. Present. Council President Pridgen. Here. Quorum is present. Great. Show you the time. Item number one, declaration of need. Okay, um, we have got notification from, oh, Donna's gonna speak on it. Commissioner Estridge. A council member, that's an original note from prior conversation, before conversations that we've recently had. Okay, so the motion on this item, uh, majority leader would be receive and file. Motion to receive and file. Okay, second. Hi, Jessica, excuse me, Jessica Brown, um, Director of Administration and Finance. I'm yes. here. Yeah, so that's Commissioner Estridge. Um, I, I just wanted to say that um, after looking at additional information about when the debt expires, um, with the help of your honorable body, we revisited the topic and took a deeper look and the mayor has no interest in extending the timeline of the control board. So after considering um, the data given by yourselves and others, we're no longer requesting approval of the declaration of need. What, what is the outstanding debt with the control board? Um, I can get that. I can look that up and get back to you. Okay. Did, didn't I ask for that before and somebody and we, um, I, I, I'll ask that question and I think we need to make sure that we're on top of responding and getting that information to us. Um, if somebody has a deputy, do you have the quick answer? Uh, correct, correct me wrong. I believe we have outstanding around $6 million. Um, currently the 05s we have 1.2 million and the 07s we have 4 million so it's about 5.3 million oh really yeah okay um now, so so yeah the, great, great. um the O fives go the smaller amount goes to 2025 and the larger amount the 07 goes to 2023 okay so about 5 million yes Okay, thank you. Did we already issue the twenty the um, bond for twenty capital budget bond? No. Oh. Uh, Delano Dow Comptroller's Office. Uh, we'll be going to market next month. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Can I just want to thank uh, the administration for uh, taking another look at this after the discussions uh, last week with uh, this council. Um, and I am pleased to hear uh, that the mayor um, took that in consideration. I think that it's important um, when we're working together as government bodies and uh, with the help of the controller's office, the administration and the council, uh, I think it was a wise decision to, to, to look back at this and to continue to work together to try our best uh, for the control board uh, to disappear. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, I guess I have a question for Corporation Council. Um, I thought the number that we had outstanding in debt was significantly more. Um, are we obligated to continue to be under the control board based, I know it's based on the legislation, but also could we bond ourselves out of that outstanding amount so that we don't we do it on our own and not through the control board and try to alleviate them a little sooner. Assistant, Assistant Corporation Council Karen Gordon. Um, my understanding of how the control board works is um, as we know it was um, introduced or um, through legislation. And so I believe until the term is up um, or unless we probably go back to Albany and, and request um, that you know the term be shortened. I don't believe that bonding would make a difference, uh, or whether we can bond or we out of the situation at this moment. But I can get further information from um on this for you, um, if you would like, for the next meeting. Okay, I know we talked about um, possibly having um, communicating with our uh, legislative body about um, removing the control board after twenty twenty five. 
Um, Cause again, the amount that we're paying in salaries is about 700,000. And again, if we can save that money for the city and use it in infrastructure, that could be extremely helpful. Um, but if you could look into that, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, motion to receive and file, seconded by oh, Majority Leader. Chairman, thank you very much. I agree with you and Council President. Uh, the control board has outlived its, its usefulness. Uh, my understanding is they meet infrequently. At times, they don't have quorums for their meetings. Uh, the information that we request at times um, is not forthcoming. Uh, we've invited them to council meetings and they have declined to do so. Uh, so I really don't know the benefit of having a control board. Um, I understand at one point uh, it was a necessity and going forward, I mean, the oversight and, and, and the fiscal responsibility falls on us, not on the control board, falls on the common council, the administration and the controller's office. Uh, and I, I think um, we have to be prudent going forward once the control board is gone. Uh, they're, they're kind of a safety net advisory right now, uh, but we have to make good decisions going forward uh, so that um, decisions we make going forward are very important. I think we should send a homeroom message uh, to our representatives to amend, change the legislation that created it allow us to perhaps bond out of it if we can, um, so we don't have to wait the five years and save the city literally millions of dollars. I think, um, I think that we should look at that, uh, the support of the Common Council. So I wanna thank the administration. I thought that, we, I, I was glad to see it was received and filed. I was, uh, we, we had a meeting of the minds. I think we, <laughs> and we had a meeting of the minds, which is something great. Um, we, we didn't have to fight for this, uh, so I want to commend the administration for working with the Common Council and the Comptroller's Office as well for the information they provided us. Thank you. A, a meeting of the, of the minds is a beautiful thing we can do it collectively on one accord, so that's great. Um, uh, so we second it by Councilmember Bowman. Next item. Mr. Chair had a question on that item. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Councilmember Wingo. Yes, uh, the question is for either the Deputy Comptroller or uh, Director Brown. Uh, how does the control board's presence here or their role slash function in the city of Buffalo impact our credit rating? Uh, I could speak a little on it first and then Greg, if you wanna add anything to it. But actually, if you guys look at the um, reports from Fitch, uh, S&P and Moody's, the help of the control board do help the city's bond rating just having that safety net, whereas they capture the sales tax first, they take out uh, their portion of the bond expense and then uh, distribute uh, sales tax revenue to the city and to uh, the board of education. Um, but as, as uh, this group has stated, um, the control board do cost uh, the city money, um, but it's, it's something I guess that we can look at in the future once we uh, finalize these uh, last two bonds, once they be Sure. Thank you for that. Now, the, the follow up question then would be um, not that I am in favor of a control board or not. Uh, that's not the point. The point is if they uh, positively impact our credit rating as a municipality, that means we would actually be able to get lower interest rates on financing, correct? When we go to market, do we get lower rates because of that credit rating? That and helps. If and if we were to not have the control board, um, our credit rating may be adversely affected. And if it is adversely affected, that means our interest rates increase. And would those increase in interest rates justify uh, the amount of savings that we would have if we did not have this uh, proverbial safety net in place? I, I, I think, um... If we, another thing we have to take into consideration, I know everyone's in favor of getting rid of the control board or dissolving it, but we also have to have to show, I believe, three positive years of growth uh, in city finances, uh, three consecutive years uh, before we even had that conversation dissolving the control board. So if the city is managing its finances uh, three consecutive years, that is a conversation uh, that we can have and possibly would reduce uh, the city's um, buying rating and having a control board in place or not. Good answer. Thank you, Deputy Controller. 
Um, Greg, did you have something to say? Um, I, I echo what Lino said. I mean, you know, whether, I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into the, the credit rating and, you know, obviously, you know, they point to the control board being a positive, you know, but if they would have went away, would it, you know, would the credit rating drop? You know, I don't know. I mean, it depends on, you know, you know, your fund balance and things like that. And, and as the deputy controller said, you know, if there's movement of reestablishing the fund balance and those positives, I think that would be, you know, also taken into consideration. Thank you. Any other comments, colleagues? Okay. Next item. Item number two, analysis of capital bond sale. Item's open. Okay, this item is open. Deputy Controller, you got that? Yes, um, the Comptroller do ask uh, that this item be uh, receiving five also along with um, the declaration of need. Primarily as stated last week, uh, Comptroller, uh, we did an analysis if the city went to the market compared to the BFSA based off the analysis uh, with our uh, city's financial advisor. Um, now that this declaration need, isn't needed or it's going to be a receiving file, we ask that the same document uh, be a receiving file unless you guys have any questions in regards to what was submitted. Any questions, colleagues? Okay, um, motion to receive and file. Motion to receive and file. Seconded by Councilmember Nowakowski. Next item. Item number three, fiscal year 2019 to 2020 audit management letter. Items open. Okay, this item is open. Deputy Controller. Um, as uh, stated, I know this is this kind of fell between the cracks, I think, on on our end. Um, really, this is uh, pertaining to uh, Dresser Malecki, um process improvements, let's say, in regards to uh, fiscal year 2019-2020 um, audit. Um, just giving suggestions on what the city can uh, do better. And we know one of the things that had been heavy on a uh, controller, one of the main things was uh, getting a fund balance replenishment plan in place, but being fiscally responsible when this plan is implemented. We understand this group uh, has reached out to Dresser Malecki and have uh, their own or their version of a um, fund balance replenishment plan. But uh, we just think uh, during COVID, it's kind of hard to implement a, a replenishment plan if, if the funding uh, isn't there. Uh, we understand uh, this additional stimulus money that will be coming to the city, uh, I believe within the next couple of months, and we might be able to have a conversation uh, to either have an implemented plan or, but when we roll out would be, uh, would be the, the main thing for us. And um, I've also this report discussed uh, creating a policy for uh, interfund loans uh, between uh, the city department. So I mean, we, we look at Dresser Malika, we appreciate uh, what they've provided, information and provided, and we will look into all their suggestions that pertain uh, to the city. So I don't know if you guys have, any, any this group have any questions in regards to the management letter, and I believe representatives uh, from Dresser Malika is on the line also. Yeah, um, Deputy Controller, thank you for your transparency and honesty. I appreciate that. Um, we asked Luke and um, I asked Chief of Staff to reach out to them because we had some questions um, regarding the, the management letter and um, just want to give them the opportunity to kind of give us a high view. Luke, if you can, on the, the, some of the key points. Um, the, the, I guess the first one is just, if you just go through the letter itself, the first one that um, I had questions on um, was the, uh, the, the communications that we were getting. You, you listed a bunch of communications regarding the finances during COVID that the council was unaware of. Um, that I don't know if there's a way that we can continue to get that information going forward. It was useful information. I know we get um, liquor license approvals that we have no authority to approve or deny, um, but it's good information for us to be aware. And this would be good information just for us to be aware. Um, is there any way we can get that information? I don't know if the controller's office gets it or who, but it would be something that the finance committee would definitely like to receive. But the communications that the controller's office provided during the 2020 summer, is that what we're referring to? Uh, on, your, on page four, you okay. have a number of correspondences 
from okay i see what you're saying yeah so what we did we put together a what this was was just i mean obviously 2020 was a very unique year given every all the instances and the information that was being presented to specifically upstate new york municipalities was quite dynamic I, at the beginning of the onset of the pandemic uh, there were projections that sales tax was going to drop 12 percent and then that kind of spiraled up to upwards of 20 to 30 percent in april and then as the uh the governor kind of had the implementation of the uh his his powers that were within these uh that were enacted by the legislature there was some threats to state aid so what this was was really just a timeline of the changing information that was changing so quickly so uh, as, as it relates to 2021, um, certainly we're monitoring it on this situation. Um, any information that we share with the deputy controller and with the controller's office, it would be able to be shared. But this was really just a, uh, an annual correspondence of kind of just giving the synopsis of the year and how quickly everything changed. And as we're seeing now, uh, we, we dated this letter uh, late October. It was provided for draft circulation in December. And everything's changed again with the, the America recovery uh, coming up. Um, so that's kind of where we are. We're, we're always available for this, this group, this finance committee, if you want us to join in and kind of just give a, a litmus test of what we've been seeing through the year. Uh, absolutely. We, we do meet with um, Deputy Controller and City Accountant Bill Ferguson throughout the year, just kind of keep them abreast of the situation. And I'm, I'm quite confident that they'll relay any uh, relevant information to this group, but certainly we're open for for any sort of involvement in the communications, especially given the the uh, situation that COVID put everyone in. <laughs> really, Mr. Chairman, I believe you're still on mute. You're on mute, council member. Yeah, I hit the wrong button, sorry. Um, the first item I wanted to ask, you know, cause you, there's a, only, you know, the top four items that you outlined regarding the interfund activity. I know that's been a concern of ours cause I saw it in the, I believe the CAFR from the, from the last couple of years that's been a concern and it's still a noted concern. So can you just speak to that a little? Sure, this is really boils down to, um, the actual general municipal law, which is states that uh, interfund loans shouldn't extend beyond the calendar year or the uh, fiscal year on June 30th. That tends to be a little bit more difficult when you have capital projects that extend throughout a year. Um, but what we're looking at is not so much the like the direct <laughs> compliance with that general municipal law in section 9A, but more so that all old uh, balances that were are carried back um, more than a fiscal year are, are cleared out. So what we're looking at is some items that were in June 30th, 2019, that probably just need a little sorting out. And we kind of didn't make such a huge alarm given all the, uh, the, the changes in the way that the government worked in, in the summer of 2020. Um, but I'm sure uh, Bill and uh, Deputy Controller Delano, you guys could chime in on, on working on where you are with cleaning those up. Understanding that there will be some exceptions when capital projects extend beyond one or two fiscal years because they are sometimes borrowing money from the general fund and back and forth in that situation. What, what do you, what do you um, think the risk is for those things when they get so far behind? Is there any significant risk? We've seen, not in the city, but we've seen other fairly large municipalities lose track of their funding and, and not know what the, what the source fundings were for capital projects. And that would risk spending money that potentially was used, was raised by debt or was uh, not refunded back to the general fund. So it becomes clerical uh, and housekeeping to make sure that you just make any, any unspent debt proceeds as this group knows must be used to, to pay back that debt within the specified amount of period of time. Um, so as capital projects aren't really main, if they're, if they're not maintained on a regular basis, which they are, I don't wanna cause the wrong sort of alarm here, um, but if, if you do fall into that kind of trap, then there, there risk that jeopardy. You're jeopardizing that uh, potential risk of, of 
giving money back to a fund when it really should be set aside for debt. We haven't seen that at the city, but it is a potential risk. Let, let me ask you, because I know the controller's office has provided us with that type of data, um, which is very specific, but um, there are items <clears throat> that are dated for some years back. Would, would those items have to keep that same date um, depending on the project? Um, if there was some proceeds received, um, because let's say so let's say it's 12 million or six million dollars we received some of the money not all the money would you maintain that same date of the initial date of activity as opposed to a newer date once you receive some of the funds if in the capital projects fund yeah, we're talking yeah. you you typically as long as you're within the debt debt requirements as far as where the that that was issued for what purpose um, you would likely just keep the same project number just to make it easier to track because the, the the alternative it seems to me that you'd have several different project codes for the same project if you, if you were to renumber it every year if i understand your question right well, no i'm speaking of the date of the activity so let's say they okay. transfer one million dollars or two million dollars one date they receive some of the proceeds regarding that particular item on that on a different date would they maintain the same uh, uh, journal date from when it first entered into our system. Okay, so are we talking about like kind of the, the flow of money coming into a project? Right. right. Uh, typically, work. your your fund balance policy now is to spend the most restrictive items first. Um, so if if I'm hearing this properly, it's essentially you're saying there's a project that has some debt proceeds, and then later on we fund it with another uh, interfund loan. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the assumption would be that the debt proceeds are more restrictive in their purpose than the interfund loan. So the capital project would expend all of the restricted fund balance for the debt and then tap into the interfund loan as needed. And that's where potentially the, the, the book, the record keeping is, it could get, um, misled is if yeah. that interfund loan is never closed out and it sits in capital projects, it gets, it could, years down the road, you could see how it gets a little bit muddy in the waters to see where it comes from. So. Got you. Okay. Any questions, colleagues, on that? Majority Leader? I want to thank Lou Malecki for uh, his advice on working with the, uh, with the controller's office and working with the finance committee. Um, Mr. Dow mentioned that um, the stimulus money is gonna come two months from now. However, we're preparing a fund balance policy in real time right now. And this might be for Luke Malecki. How important is, is it that we have the fund balance policy before the stimulus, before we receive the stimulus funds? Uh, well, I think in our conversations, the, the, the finance committee also discussed about if, if there was excess funding coming in as well, what the purpose is of using it for that. So I think in that, as it relates to the potential of, I mean, if the numbers come to fruition that are being thrown out there, um, you, you, it looks like you'll have some, after you make your revenues good in the 2020, 2021 years, uh, there will be some excess capacity that we're still waiting the concrete guidance on how to use that. Uh, but the indications are is to use it for infrastructure projects related to water, sewer, and broadband of the like. And I know in the discussions, I don't know where you stand on the final policy, but the discussions were uh, to, in the, in, to also include a range of fund balance that would be uh, in uh, a ceiling, so to speak, and what the intention of the, the, of the, the recommendation of the finance committee and, and the, the greater body of the whole common council, what their recommendation would be to use those excess funds for. Um, as far as the, the, the uh, not having the fund balance policy in, in place for, the, I, I, I think absent the um, federal stimulus money coming in, I think it'd be best practice to have some sort of mechanism in place before the budget talks for the 2021, 2022 year come to fruition. Um, just to kind of give the the guidance so that the the the, the three entities, the three part, the, the three um, bodies of government are on the same page as as for as far as where that budget's going. 
Um, and it kind of goes part and parcel with the federal money coming in, um, because if, if the Common Council puts out a fund balance policy that says, hey, we need to get fund balance to level X, and the federal stimulus money does that, well, then your budget, your budget policy becomes more on a, on a looking at the immediate fiscal year, whereas if you put that policy in and, and for whatever reason, um, I, I've, I've also seen what Deputy Comptroller said is that 60 days with those programs that have CDBGs, um, so you, you fit into that category, but if for some reason it gets tied up, then you, you potentially have that fund balance policy to get kick into place for the, uh, the next year's budget pr um, calendar. Thank you, Luke. And I agree. I think we should have a fund balance policy going into our next budget um, with a goal. I'm not saying we're going to reach it, but this is the goal, whether it's 60 days, whether it originally is 30 days. We have set a goal um, and we'd like to achieve that. Uh, and I think that working together with the controller's office and hopefully the administration we can have a fund balance policy that when the control board is out of uh, no longer here, uh, the fund rating agency or the credit rating agencies will look at that favorably in terms of our interest. So I think that's one way of making up for the interest rates as well, having a fund balance policy. And I think the sooner we do it, the better because we don't want to uh, continue the path that we have over the many years. The stimulus is a one-time um, one time kind of allocation to the city of Buffalo. I don't see us getting any more stimulus money. So it gives us a chance to, to right side or to reset and to um, pay down our debt um, and have a fund balance policy that is not too restrictive, that can work with the administration. We still have to operate the city. We still have to pay police and fire, and, uh, but uh, we have a policy that understands that we have to put money away for circumstances that may arise, another pandemic, or something that, that may occur. Um, we need to have a fund balance policy uh, that has some funds in it, and we're not dependent on the Board of Education to borrow from them all the time. So I think that we need to move forward with this fund balance policy uh, for the next budget. And I think we should look at working uh, as quickly as possible to put that in place and to make sure that there is a fund balance policy and that we adhere to the policy as well. I mean, what good is having a policy if we don't adhere to it? Whether it's in the charter or whether it's a policy, we should have some teeth to adhere to it. Uh, so that's our conversation that we're having right now. And I think that uh, I thank the, the Finance Committee and all of its members for meeting and discussing this. Thank you very much. Councilmember yeah, Bowman. Yeah, uh, just along that thought process, um, I can remember pre-pandemic when we were talking about, you know, initiating the fund balance and there were people saying that it wasn't the right time. I fully understand, you know, our fiscal state right now, but I think a fund balance, you know, would set guardrails of within what we can operate and it would also have a release valve if say something happened with the stimulus or if we weren't able to achieve said goal that year, you know, we, we would be able to get out of it or not have to allocate that year. So I think it's about setting the guardrails and moving forward. So it, as you kind of said, Delano, I, we're going to be reaching out and trying to see what, you know, we're, we're just gathering information and trying to put it together, but we will be reaching out to try to talk to you see where the controllers at and be, you know, pushing this around to get everybody's input and, and move forward at that point. But I'm definitely of the mind state that I believe we need these guardrails uh, to have a fund balance policy in place. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next um, line item loop was um, the delinquent water bills. Yeah, before I, it looked like a, another council member had a, a something to add on that i'm sorry who, who i'm sorry council member council member nowakowski it's okay thank you mr chair i just wanted to echo the sentiments of my colleague um brian bowman because it really is you know this conversation isn't you know at times fun you know saving is you know there's never a perfect time but we've had this conversation uh pre-pandemic and now post-pandemic and you know setting up guardrails to you know 
further you know, help our fiscal stability is the direction we need to go and it's the direction we will be going. So I think just including everybody on from the controller's office to the administration and coming up with a policy that works for all of us, um, I think is achievable. And I, I think that we're all there. And um, I just have a quick question for uh, Deputy Controller Dowell. Do we have any direction of how this money will be coming down yet and how flexible it is? And, you know, and, and, if, and if so, you know, what debt payments can we uh, pay off, you know, within uh, the first, you know, two, three months? Well, at this point, we don't have any concrete information on what's allowable, what's not allowable uh, with these funds. As soon as we get that information from the uh, federal government, uh, we'll share uh, the information with this group if you guys don't already have it, also with the administration. So I think once we receive guidance on what the funds can be used for, then we can address uh, the concerns or address what can we, what can we can't do uh, with this funding. I know the controller's goal is to, uh, if allowable, to set aside funding to cover uh, the $25 million uh, revenue deficiency note that's due on December uh, 31st. Uh, but like I said, uh, the controller's goal is really just to put it out there, but it's really up to, um, I think, the administration and common council uh, to take care of that. But once the funding, I mean, as soon as we get the guidance of what the funding can be used for the controller's office along with administration and uh, common council can have a discussion. And if I could, we, our firm works with well over 100 New York municipalities. So you're not alone in our, our uh, portfolio as far as monitoring this status. And we're working quite closely with actually a couple of county clients that are in the same boat as you. So as new information comes to us, we'll be sure to share that with uh, Deputy Controller Dowell so that he has that available to himself. Um, the deputy controller, you said that um, the deficiency bond is due this year because I said I thought it said in one of the audit documents it was 2022. In the audit document, it says fiscal year. Fiscal year 2022, but it's due December 31st, 2021. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, Luke, can you just talk a little bit about the delinquent water bills? Sure, that's been a, a, a comment we've had in there for a few years now. Um, right now, the policy is that delinquent water bills would get put onto a, a tax lien. And then obviously when that tax lien, if it, if it does go delinquent, the water fees would kind of go with it rather than actually working with um, a collection agency, which is where we, we see some of our other water authorities and sewer authorities would work on rather than putting it on the, the, uh, the tax lien. Because essentially, if you put it on a tax lien and then the property goes to auction, you're just foregoing any sort of any sort of revenue, where if, if you took a step and put it to a collection agency first, you'd be able to collect it. We understood that including it this year was kind of a, a mute point given the, the circumstances of the economy and, and the taxpayers. However, it, once we put a comment in a, in a uh, management letter, it's really hard to pull it unless there's been action on it. So this is, it's what we would refer to as a repeat comment that just to kind of raise awareness and an alternative way of doing it. Okay, and, and I think that the administration responded that they're not looking to turn anyone's water off this year. So <laughs> just wanna make it clear to people, no one's looking to turn your water off. And I'm glad that they um, had some sensitivity to that people's um, dilemma um, in their finances, not to uh, shut off people's water. Um, one thing that concerns me really is the capital asset policy. Um, I know that I've, we talked about this some years ago, but you made another point in this management letter. And I think that's something that we may need to look at as a finance committee regarding that. Can you speak to that? Sure. Uh, what we're looking at, there, there's certainly controls and systems of policies in individual departments, but there is not a universal formalized capital asset um, policy specifically regarding um, the communication of disposals of capital assets to the accounting department um, and how to, how to notify certain departments that are, wouldn't be going through the engineering and ca uh, capital project facilities to add assets. Um, so your, your smaller departments, if they're adding vehicles or equipment, um, just getting a little bit more standardized to making sure that those inventory records are being appropriately maintained in the city. As of now, it's really just a year end um, kind of task that, that the city's accountants just dispatch throughout the city to the different departments to compile the information. 
ideally the a capital asset policy would, re, would require kind of a continuous reporting to the accounting department on, on the asset acquisitions and disposals. Okay, um, any questions colleagues? So we have some, we have a process, it's just not uniform. Yeah, it's not uniform and it's probably not the most uh, compassionate to the accounting department because they're getting ready for year end and then they have to kind of compile this information from several different departments um, when it could just be a, a simple, uh, hey, we bought an asset in whatever month and here's the, here's the form that, shut, that, okay. that allows it. So do we, do, do we depreciate our assets? Yes. Okay, so any vehicles that we have, um, buildings, all those capital things we would have, we would depreciate. That's correct, yeah. Okay. Um, any questions, colleagues, on that? No? Last thing is the new reporting requirements. Yep. Who would be responsible? Is that the controller's office or would that be finance? That's the controller's office. Uh, they'll be responsible for implementing those. Uh, as I said, we're, we're working with several different governments, so you're not alone in implementing these. So as um, Bill goes through uh, the implementation of specifically the ones that will, will hit most significantly are the Government Accounting Standards Board number 84, which takes a look at your trust and agency accounts, creates a custodial type fund, um, puts some of those liabilities back in the general fund. We'll work with your, your accounting staff to make sure that uh, their interpretations are consistent with the governmental gap and with what government accounting standard board's intent was. And then the other one is leases. Uh, any, any sort of leases are, are being re-looked at to be more uh, construed as capital leases versus operating leases. So without getting too deep into the accounting jargon is uh, that will be Bill's responsibility that he'll be uh, have us on speed dial to work through on, on trying to implement those. I'm just wondering, is Bill gonna need an army to, do, to incorporate these things? <laughs> I think Bill's got a good team right now. I think he'll be all right. No, we'll be perfectly fine. <laughs> okay. I have no doubts about that. All right. Thanks, Bill. Um, any other comments, gentlemen? Okay. One thing if I could just add about the, with the yeah. genesis of the comment for the water bills, that came several years ago. Um, it was pointed out at a water board meeting that Buffalo is one of the few municipalities in the state that does not attach to Lincoln water to their to the um to the property. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it wasn't back before the tax system went on Munis, it was on our homegrown system. And just it was more of a logistical situation of trying to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's, that's just a little, little bit more of the historical background um, from several years ago. So we need to revisit it and, and change up in, as far as how we do that going forward, like Luke was mentioning? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I can't really recommend on the right or wrong way to do it. We just wanted to point out that it's different and that if you're comfortable with the way it's going to be done this way, then you know we'll, we'll, we'll take that response and remove it from the management letter for next year. But to this point, it really hasn't been discussed. It's just been communicated. That's why we left it in there for this year. Okay. If there's any more comments for Luke, um, we should be okay. Okay, Luke, thank you so much. Appreciate sure. it. Thank you. Okay. Um, can we motion to table? Motion to table. Seconded by Council Member Bowman. Next item. Item number four, NeoGov Applicant Tracking System. Item Sultan. Okay, and we have Director Springer here speak on this item. Hey, Director, how you doing? Good morning, Mr. Chairman. I'm doing well. How are you? Good. Um, I know this is kind of unusual being in the Finance Committee, but um, the cost and, you know, just some of the other issues that we've dealt with as far as contracts, I was very interested in knowing how we're going to do this one. Um, but I'm, I am glad that you're putting this forward. I think um, doing my master's, um, we did a presentation on a more ex um, efficient process for people to apply for the city. I um, mean, it was more geared towards the firefighters and police, um, but I guess this is kind of a catch off. So can you just give us an overall explanation of this, this project? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so uh, the city put forth an RFP uh, for this applicant tracking and reporting system. Uh, our committee found that NeoGov is, was the, uh, uh, the best value to the city. Uh, I'm sure most of you have some experience with filing anything with civil service. 
and you know the mounds of paperwork that are that are involved with that. Um, this uh, will uh, resolve most of that issue. You'll be able to file electronically uh, and apply for jobs electronically. Uh, it will also uh, track and uh, step applicants through the process, including examinations uh, and any fees that are due. Uh, so for, for instance, the folks that are doing public safety examinations or applying for jobs for uh, public safety, they'll get stepped through that entire process and all the required information and forms can be uploaded to this uh, uh, SaaS solution. That's a software as a service solution. Uh, so it is uh, not housed here on site. It is a, a remote site. Uh, some of the features, uh, obviously the folks uh, applying will be able to create logins. Uh, the logins and their area on NeoGov will store all of their past applications and uh, as well as step them through the future ones. Uh, and uh, as you move through the employment process, if you do get hired, you still maintain that, uh, that login account so that you can go back and refer to any jobs that you, must have, you might have applied in the past for. Um, so it will do the, the workflow. It also does email notifications uh, to the constituents. It will also handle e-signatures for when you're applying for a job. Um, it will uh, eventually integrate with our payroll system. So once you move to actually becoming an employee, it will migrate that information from NeoGov into Munis, which is our payroll system. Um, it also allows for, uh, as I mentioned, safe and secure online payments for exam fees. Uh, and you will, it will also allow us to post our jobs on uh, governmentjobs.com, which will hopefully broaden the applicant pool uh, for when we do applications. Uh, so the first year uh, for this, uh, the cost is uh, just over $70,000. Again, it's a SaaS solution. So it's kind of about the upper uh, echelon of um, cost because it's not hosted here. Uh, the four additional one-year renewal terms uh, will not exceed 64, uh, just over 64,000. Um, uh, and the four-year terms are optional. You don't have to uh, buy into the four years if you choose to cancel. Uh, if we do cancel, we do have uh, uh, a route to collect all of our data from, from the vendor and use it for whatever we choose for the next vendor. Um, I think that's most of the uh, high-end uh, features for the product. Um, I welcome any questions from Rosanna Robotti. Uh, if anybody has any. Um, I guess who else is using this? What other organizations are using this product? Anyone locally? Uh, I believe they are just out, they're located actually just outside of Rochester, New York. Uh, they do have a number of uh, other cities throughout New York State, and I can compile a list and send them to you uh, uh, after the meeting if you would like, uh, Mr. Chairman. You know, honestly, I, I really would like a presentation from them. Okay. Um, is this time sensitive, um, Daryl? Um, no. Okay. No, it, I mean, it's a balance, right? So it's helpful because we're in the pandemic era where uh, being able to uh, apply for jobs electronically is very, mm -hmm. very helpful. Yeah. Um, and I do uh, would like to encumber the money out of this fiscal year instead of next fiscal year. So there's okay. a little time. I mean, we've got a little time for that. But, uh, we can, yeah. we can do a presentation if you like. Okay, we can have someone do a presentation and I promise you, I'm not gonna try to prolong it because I think it's an excellent idea. I just had some questions as far as like, I know that it does candidate scoring. Um, yes. Going, is. How, how is that? Because, you know, we've had issues um, with um, some and how things have been done in the past. And that was probably on a more human level where you know, it may have been someone who was ins uh, insensitive or not um, have any type of insight with um, minority communities. Mm -hmm. So with this process, it would not be something like that. It would just be through the system and how is that conducted? How is that scoring determined? So there's uh, two sides to the system. There's basically your applicant facing side where if I'm an applicant, I can go in and, and search for my exam results and the scores. 
There's also the administrative side, which is uh, uh, handled by the HR department um, and civil service. So once the exams are conducted, uh, as I understand it, the uh, results will come down from the state. We will import those right into the system and it will line up and attach to the applicant so that they can go in and see, view their results uh, once they're available. Oh, okay. So when you take the test, that's where it's the candidate scoring is not it where it's taking your information and it's scoring you. It's basically taking your test and uh, providing it through the system so that you can see your test score. Yes, and I and I don't uh, because I'm, I I don't work with on civil service and I don't really work on exams for public safety. So my knowledge is a little bit limited on how that process works. Um, but uh, as I understand it, the, the results will come from the state. I know there's a, a bunch of uh, uh, like physical testing and other testing that happens locally uh, that would be uploaded to that, uh, to that system. Um, and I would defer, Kirk, do you, I, I asked my colleague, Kirk McLean, uh, Director of Open Data to join us. Kirk, did you uh, recall any information about the specifics of public safety uh, examination process? Um, no, not offhand. Um, okay. Yeah. That's I, I do know, um, uh, speaking to one of Councilman Wise's questions is that all the um, screening hurdles and screening weights are configurable by the city. So um, based on what our, um, what our qualifications are for people to get hired, we can configure all that. And then the, the system auto scores the best candidates. So, so you would just be forwarding the information in the portal. So let's say if for, so police, fire, everyone would be able to go through this portal going forward once it's up and, up and live. My, my understanding is that every, every department um, will be hiring through this applicant tracking system. Okay. Yeah, because I, I know that when we were doing our project, um, the reams of paper HR was using to keep up and I tell you um, to do that is unbelievable. I'm um, in this day and age. So I'm honestly, I'm really happy to hear this about this project because I think it's going to give us better candidates um, and it's going to be make the process a little more efficient where there's not a question regarding someone's, um, uh, uh, you know, ability or them being okay. Because I think one in the, in the past, it was information individuals who stated that they never, the HR never received and all that back and forth. So that will streamline the process. So it's time dated in the system. They can go through the portal. They see what they receive. They see what they <laughs> and it makes it a lot better process for everyone in the city. So I'm, I'm excited about it, but if we can just have that presentation. Um, now you said that the cost could not be more than 60 something thousand after this year, but I saw that there was a transaction cost and right. I, know, I know it was 25 cents, but you know, yeah, that, that, that actually put a pretty significant delay on uh, getting the, the contract agreed upon. Um, they had originally had a uh, roughly $500 a month payment just to be able to use uh, the, the payment portal that integrates with their system. Uh, we crunched some numbers and figured out that the city, you know, on the lower months, you know, there, there might be only a hundred transactions, which, which the cost of $500 a month wasn't, uh, wasn't of any value to the city. So we had uh, renegotiated that to be 25 cents uh, per transaction when you do an examination fee. Uh, it ended up being cheaper for the city, so yeah. Any questions, colleagues? Last question, Daryl. As far as the background check, is that a third party that does the background check or that's coming through our police department? I believe our police department does the background checks on folks, but I would have to re really have to refer to HR to, to okay. the, the for sure answer on that. Okay, so so if you can have someone for us by the next committee to present, um, we can move on this, but I definitely would like to see a presentation. Not a problem, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Do that. And no questions, colleagues? Okay, um, motion to table. Motion to table. Seconded by Council President Perchick. No further items. Okay, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Seconded by Councilmember Balmy.